Good day. Uh, I'm Bob Trum, the director of the Center for the Political Future at USC Burnside. Uh, and I'm here to introduce uh, and to have a conversation with uh, Mike Murphy, the co-director of the center, and our new one of our new fellows, Nicole Whiteman. Nicole Whiteman is the chief executive officer of the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation. Uh, in recognition of her leadership and the foundation's work, the Dodgers are the proud recipient of the ESPN Sports Humanitarian Team of the Year Award. Nicole will be teaching a course this fall called Nonprofit Leadership, Advancing the Missions in Unprecedented Times on Mondays from 10 a.m. to 12.20 p.m. Pacific. Uh, interested students can apply to join the class by visiting our website. Uh, Nicole, I look forward to welcoming you in person on campus this fall. And I'm gonna let Mike Murphy, uh, our co-director, start, start us off with the first question. All right, excellent. Nicole, great to join you and Bob. Thank you for being here as always. And thank you and our, uh, our digital audience for joining us here. So now I know what you're all thinking, which is this is yet another uh, sneaky Bob Shrum attempt to score some free Dodgers tickets, but I can as assure you it's not. It's an attempt by me to get some Dodger tickets. No, no. We are so happy, Nicole, to have you with us. And we're fascinated by the whole intersection of politics, sports, pop culture. So let me start out with a real, real fastball question here to use a baseball analogy. Tell us about the foundation. I, I've done a little research. It's, I would argue, the biggest and most successful a, a baseball team link foundation. We'll probably get a little complaint from New York, but I'm all right with that. Uh, you guys won an SB uh, for it. It's really quite amazing. I think you've, you, you've touched uh, like hundreds of thousands of, and it's, it, it's huge. So why don't you walk our audience through, uh, you know, the story of the Dodger foundation and what you guys have been working on, maybe some things that we don't know that our students could be interested in. Yeah, thank you, Mike, and thanks, Bob. I'm looking forward so much to being a fellow this year and teaching this course. Um, the Dodgers Foundation is really about ensuring that every Angelino has the opportunity to thrive. Our mission is to tackle some of LA's most pressing problems, and that is education, healthcare, homelessness, and social justice. We actually run programs and we fund programs. So through, through with those social justice lens, we're getting at the root causes and the challenges that we believe face predominantly youth throughout the Los Angeles community, but additionally, those adults who need to show up in a youth's life in order to ensure their success. And so we actually run programs like Dodgers RBI, our sports-based youth development program, where we serve 10,000 kids at about 76 locations throughout Los Angeles and, and Long Beach. And it's about health and education and, and sports. And so using sport, we impart on children access and opportunity. And then we build baseball fields here in Los Angeles in the underserved communities. And so we have to date 57 Dodgers dream fields. Yes, they're for baseball and softball, but they're actually green spaces that present themselves as a significant amount of community pride. And then we've got initiatives like our Science of Baseball initiative, our LA Reads initiative, our In This Together initiative. Um, we've contributed about $32 million throughout the Los Angeles community in, a, in, in really our programs that we run and also funding about 100 different local nonprofits annually. The work is really bigger than baseball. It, it is, Mike, about ensuring that those who are in the shadows of Dodger Stadium are seen and heard and their voices are amplified. Uh, let me follow up on that because we've had as fellows previously, journalists, political operatives, folks who've held public office. Uh, and you just talked about some of the issues that uh, they deal with all the time as part of their lives. How, you're the, really the first fellow from the nonprofit world. How do nonprofits interact with, compete with, or complement the decisions and work done by political leaders? Yeah, you know what, um, Bob, you hit it on the head. As the second largest city in the nation, LA has tremendous challenges that require a collaborative approach. And together with public and corporate entities, we enhance the impact of the work that we do and the lives of those that we serve. The reality is we're teammates um, with political leaders. 
They are on this on our team. We are on their team. At LADF, I mentioned we like to say that it's bigger than baseball. And it was, when it comes to getting the work done and challenging lives, we only compete against the elements that threaten the health of the participants that we serve, not against each other. So local elected officials actually have been great partners in building Dodgers Greenfields in local communities. They've helped us promote our sports-based youth development program in their communities to their constituents. And they've actually helped us promote a vast amount of our initiatives and opportunities to families in their districts who need us most. And so they show up for us, we've shown up for them, but it's about partnership, right? We align on so many of these important issues that many of them have just been champions to move our projects forward. And they know that our work enhances the lives of those who frankly put them in office. You know, it's interesting. I, um, in my travels, you know, nonprofits almost always are a net positive, but there's a huge spectrum of effectiveness. And, you know, I hear that concern from donors, et cetera. You know, does the dollar really get there? Are there metrics on the programs? And, you know, you look at the Gates Foundation and others that have kind of pioneered that results-based theory. In your experience as a you know, major executive in this world, what are the keys to an effective nonprofit? You know, what, yeah. what, what's the best practices to really, really move a needle, measure it, and, and have that kind of success like you guys have had? Yes, absolutely. I feel like you've got to be able to answer the so what every day. Yeah. And answering the so what really is having a strong strategic plan and a strong vision and staff and board members who support and drive that. But you've got to have data, metrics, measurement, and evaluation in place. I like to say here at the Dodgers Foundation, we don't do anything if we can't answer the question, so what? For us, it's really about ensuring that we're getting at true outcomes for the youth and the families that we serve. And so having an impact framework where you understand the goals and objectives of everything that you do. And frankly, everyone is bought into that, right? And everyone on the team has the same and similar values that are then executed and imparted upon the various communities that, that we're working with and that we're serving. It's so important to have that strategic plan. Oftentimes, I think nonprofits, you know, people see them different from a corporation or a business. Yes, the revenue, the bottom line may be different, right? It might be sales versus fundraising and things of that nature. But ultimately, outcome is important. Outputs are so important. And so we like to say that our programs are proven programs, and we like to fund proven programs. Those who are taking the time, Mike, to measure and evaluate as they go along the impact that they're having. Um, there's a million nonprofits, and so we can all say we do a lot of different things. But when you can really look at someone and they can really share with you, here's exactly you know, what we've been able to do. Uh, it's it's just far far more impactful and frankly leads to a successful nonprofit. Uh, let me touch on something a little more controversial. Uh, there are critics who hurl insults at athletes like "shut up and dribble" or "shut up and bat." Uh, can you talk about the intersection between sports and controversial issues and the impact of athletes involving themselves in the public square? Yeah, so, well, a lot of that in that last, in this last year, for sure. Sports is woven into the, into the fabric of America. I mean, baseball is woven into the fabric of America. So by leveraging sport and leveraging the games, we get to capture the attention of a significant portion of the population. And while most people view professional sports as an escape, it has also been used during some of our most traumatic times, such as the last maybe 15 years, to rally us around a common goal. I often say, Two people can have different religions, different beliefs, different sexual orientation. They sit in the seats next to each other at Dodger Stadium. They instantly become family. They instantly become friends. Oftentimes, I think we focus on our differences, but we have major things in common. The reality is everyone wants to be free, whether that's free to live, free to raise a family, free to you know, exist regardless of color, regardless of skin color, regardless of sexual orientation or religious orientation. And when we break down these basic principles, of we just all wanna live, it becomes easier to facilitate this conversation, Bob. Sports is a vehicle that brings us together as we acknowledge that opportunities are not afforded to us all. The reality is many times critics do say that athletes should stay out, stay in their lanes and they need to address you know, their own issues on the court. But I say that fighting for justice is their court. Fighting for equality is their field. Injustice affects all in our overall um, society and our overall health and sports is a part of that. And because of the loud voice that sports has, 
they, they, they capture an attention and they get people, they gather people and get people together in a way that it just can't be done. Um, you don't ignore a burning house on your street just because it's not yours. Eventually it's gonna spread. And so I think that athletes get to play that kind of a role when it comes to you know, being a part of um, very crucial conversations. Okay, I'm gonna, let my, I'm gonna let Mike follow that up, even though I'm gonna tell you something he didn't. He's a Detroit Tigers fan. <laughs> I have always been a Dodgers fan. Well, you're Mike, from here, Bob. I grew up in Detroit. We're um, going to give you a pass, Mike, just for this conversation. Well, um, they, they are a great team. Uh, so <laughs> let me follow up on this because this is a tricky area. Um, and I want to kind of lump celebrities together, both in the sports world and in, from entertainment. They have certain talents that in their professional world are usually asymmetrical. They do really well with them. To their credit, it's not easy to be great at something or to have performing, you know, artistic talent. But with that comes a platform. And I see a lot of celebrities out there doing incredibly positive work. On the other hand, it's kind of like unlicensed doctors in some ways. There, there are some who have the platform but may not think before they opine with all that attention. You know, do you guys, I'm just curious in running your foundation, if a famous player comes to you and wants to become a little more educated in public policy, so when they use that, that bully pulpit, it hopefully is informed and effective rather than somebody spouting off opinions. I mean, I would be very happy to come down to the bullpen and give a lot of my opinions about baseball to everybody. I'm not sure they'd be that interested, nor do I think I'd add very much value. So is that part of what you do or is done in, in Major League Baseball? I, I've worked in the NBA world a little. Um, and I think there is kind of an awareness to at least offer that ability because you want to try to try to teach people to use their platform as, as responsibly as possible. So I'm just curious about how how the world you're in kind of works with that. So you, you you try to give people the tools to be as effective as possible. And because in our Twitter world, it's also easy to be a famous idiot, whether you come from reality TV, hint, hint, or, or somewhere else and maybe not be that constructive in a time of so much polarization where the last thing we need is another flaming log on the Twitter fire. Yeah, you know what? I think that one of my proudest things here at the Dodgers Foundation is working with our Dodger players to help them to find their voice, Mike. Yeah. And it's about engaging and educating them. I love that they come to us on the Dodgers Foundation side and they want to learn about the issues that we are focusing on. They also wanna to talk to me specifically about the issues that maybe have even impacted them or that they just want to know more about. It's, it's this interesting part where they're like an expansion of our Dodgers Foundation team and they help us to share many of the important messages about equity and equality and inclusion that we're pushing forward. Although a lot of the issues do not directly impact many of them to your point, right? Sometimes they can come across as empty, or you're not relating to it, or that's not your experience, but they are using their platforms to help amplify the voices of others. And I think our encouragement is also either tell your own story and so someone can really feel the tangible connection that you have to the cause, or frankly, make sure that you're amplifying and telling the story of somebody else so that someone can hear, the, hear, hear, the, hear that, right? I think that, yes, there's a, a whole lot of of controversy when one player decides to sort of share things that might not be in alignment with how other feels, but we also have to rem remember that they are human beings, right? And we all have our own opinion. And to your point, they're, they're somewhat unlicensed doctors in, in many, you know, <laughs> many spaces, but it's, a, it's an opportunity to use that platform if educated to share the message because you know that the celebrities and the players Folks follow them. Folks listen. Um, you right. know, they, they have that attention. Yeah, the only thing I would pitch, and this is not about the Dodgers Foundation because all I know about it is it's excellent, but I, I'm on the national board of the Public Charter School Alliance, yeah. and we have sports and, and entertainment celebrities who kind of find us, and we're trying to work with these organizations to make sure the menu of education is ideologically balanced. Because often, you know, it takes work to get to that, because otherwise I think it, it diminishes their ability if they don't read from the full menu, because then people start discounting it as kind of, well, they're all signed up to one agenda and on and on they go. So, um, but I'm happy to hear all that work is being done, because that's fantastic. Yes. I, I'm going to switch gears again a little bit. Uh, 
can you tell us about your own path, your own career path, yeah. and what led you to what you're doing now with the foundation? Yes, I have a very interesting career path. Um, although I've been an Angelino for 20 years, I'm actually a native New York, um, who is a first generation American, first generation college graduate. Um, and so I have had the pleasure, frankly, of living on both coasts. And I started my career in investment banking. I graduated from Spelman College with a degree in economics and a minor in management and organization. And I said I was going to go back to Wall Street and be an investment banker for life. Um, after about a year and a half, I actually, while loving working uh, for a Fortune 500 company, I felt like something was missing. And so, Bob, I ended up actually making a shift. And I went to work in publishing and I worked for two magazines in New York in the sponsorship marketing and advertising space for a number of years, um, really honing so many different skills. And I paired that with the sound financial um, skills that I had gained in the team building and other skills that I had gained from the investment world. And I relocated to Los Angeles while working for a magazine. And I was approached by the president and CEO of the Jackie Robinson Foundation. I actually received the Jackie Robinson F Foundation scholarship as a student in college. And they were opening up an LA office and they asked me to come and lead. And I thought, wow, I had not thought about the nonprofit world, but so many of my experiences and my frankly experience as a Jackie Robinson scholar and a product of the, the, the actual organization it made it a really ideal situation for me. I often tell people I got a doctoral degree in nonprofit management on the job working for the Jackie Robinson Foundation. I got a chance to serve as their vice president, Western Region Director for six years. Um, loved it. I got introduced to so many amazing uh, baseball teams, including the Detroit Tigers, Mike. So that I did meet the Tigers <laughs> during my, my Jackie Robinson Foundation time. Excellent. Um, and <laughs> I gained so many tools and I knew that I had found the space in which I wanted to live and work. In a full circle of events, I, I eventually accepted a position to work for LA's Promise, a local education public school reform entity. I worked for College Summit. And eventually I was recruited by the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation. Um, my stories, frankly, of college access, college success, you know, first generation, all of those things, they melt into a place where I'm doing work every single day that I wake up loving to do. It's so rewarding. And I get to serve youth and families that I truly believe were me and my family. Mm -hmm. What was the well, biggest headwind you, you found because you really get a lot of credit well earned for for amping up and revitalizing the Dodgers Foundation. So when you showed up there to do that, what, what was the greatest challenge? G give us a few practical tips from your experience, because, you know, you're, you're widely acclaimed for having done an incredible job. There. Yeah, I think no secret, Mike, you know, the previous iteration of the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation, the Dodgers Dream Foundation, um, was plagued with a little bit of, of, of just trauma um, through a lot of division that was occurring in the organization within that time. And the reality is I was handed a new logo and a new name and told to build, create, and, and do that. Um, it was a challenge that I accepted wholeheartedly, but it meant building a team of amazing individuals that I've surrounded myself with that have helped us build what we had the last eight years. It's really been about creating strong programs, being able to fund um, strong programs for, of other organizations, developing fundraising um, tactics. One of the main things that was true, tried and true for me was creating that connection between Dodger fans and the greater Los Angeles community to understand the role of the Dodgers Foundation and how if individuals, fans and otherwise partner with us, we can have so much of a greater impact on the community. So the, the, the idea of taking this brand, this very strong, iconic yeah. brand, and using it to the, the advantage of changing lives around and, and, and surrounding Dodger Stadium, um, I took it on as a, a, a very significant challenge. But I think that we've been very methodical in how we've approached it, very strategic. Um, and I do believe that all my past experiences kind of led me to be able to lead the way in which I'm leading here. And you guys have really, just a quick follow-up, and I know, know Bob's got more insults about the Tigers. Um, <laughs> What in, on the development side, I was stunned by the, the amount of resources you guys have been able to gather. Is that highly board driven or what? Because all the nonprofits I bump into, the first complaint is, oh, how do we raise some money? 
And so I'm just curious about, you know, what your best practices have been, because I believe it's over $30 million. Am I correct? Yes. Yes, we've, wow. we've actually invested about 32 million and we've wow. increased fundraising each year by a thousand percent uh, from where we started. The reality is we do a, a significant job in stadium fundraising. And so fans get so many unique ways to participate in and out of games. We host fundraising events. And so fans, again, and donors and folks throughout Los Angeles get to participate. We have created a, a gala. We created a, a run uh, we've used the stadium as a property to make sure that we're bringing people together outside of games and been able to raise money in that way. We've also had the great support of so many local foundations and corporations who are also corporate partners of the team who want to partner with us to help amplify their philanthropy sure. platforms. And so a lot of it has been partnership. It has truly been collaborations with individuals, foundations, corporations, and I can't leave out our players. Um, our players have come, showed up, um, in immeasurable ways as it relates to being able to fund together some really significant initiatives. Outstanding. Uh, so of all the things you've done uh, at the foundation, uh, can you single out any one or two that you think make the most difference and that you're the most proud of? Wow, it's hard, but um, I am most proud of the fact that so many communities consider us an ally. I say that some of the nonprofits, I think some of the things we have to think about often is that buy-in um, in the communities that we serve is, is really special, unique, and important in order for you to do the work. And I'm really proud of that. When I drive through the city and I pass by parks where we host our programs, I often get chills seeing young people in Dodgers RBI uniforms playing outside on our refurbished fields. Um, that gives me a significant sense of pride. When I see youth and families in a better position because of our efforts, it's the greatest form of validation. Like that right there, when a mom walks up to me on a Saturday event and says, hey, my son is thinking about college because he attended your college and career accelerator, that makes me proud. I think there's been so many moments of extreme, extreme pride. And 2020, interestingly enough, you mentioned it in the introduction, Bob, we won the 2020 ESPN Sports Humanitarian Team of the Year Award. And it was during a very difficult time with the pandemic. We had doubled down. We were on the grounds in communities, distributing meals and more. And it was the motivation that we needed in that moment in time to move forward. It was a recognition, recognition of our hard work, our tremendous work and sacrifice. And while we don't do the work for the recognition, I have to say in that moment in time, um, it was definitely uh, uh, added benefit and certainly much needed. I always will cherish how 2020 forced us to really look at things with an even more intentional lens. And so proud, honestly, again, of the extreme pride coming from families saying, you showed up for us in our most significant times of need. You know, when I think about um, challenges, right, that I've faced or that we face as an organization, it would absolutely be COVID-19. It, it, it taught us so much about ourselves. It taught me so much about myself as a leader, um, but truly the pride comes from really being able to celebrate the families and the successes that they get from what we're able to provide. Okay, even though Mike has, even though Mike's team has not won the World Series since 1984. <laughs> oh, someone who can work Google. I'm gonna turn this back to him for a minute. <laughs> All right, well, you're well, up at bat. <laughs> okay. Um, Stay tuned. We have a plan. We're, we're luring the rest of the teams into a sense of false security. So let's do career day, Nicole, for a minute. After Bob tries to talk some poor kid into a, a career in uh, the ACLU, and they don't like my pitch to go work for Chevron, they come to you and they say, what about a career in the nonprofit world? You know, what would you tell them? What's the path? How to prepare themselves? How do you get a job there? What, what's Nonprofit Career Building 101 for some of our students? Yeah, first I wanna say that it is any undergraduate major and it is any graduate major. I personally do not feel like you have to decide at the age of 16 that you are going to be an executive director of a foundation or hold a position in a nonprofit. I think that it's really an understanding of the impact that you can have in the lives of those who have been forgotten and getting passionate about a cause. The best leaders in the nonprofit space are those who are passionate about the cause. I would advise students that it really take the time to really take the time to research their cause of interest, right? Whether it's personal or it's something that you're just really tied to, 
it's about that. I often say to people, you must volunteer. You must volunteer. You have to show up for that cause. You have to show up for an understanding of looking at a team that's actually working on it. You have to be um, much more. It has to be much more than just a desire to help. Like you've got to arm yourself with information about the community where you want to work or the people you want to serve. What are the cultural differences? I think that educating yourself on the history of maybe the marginalized group, those things are so important. Never approach a cause or a community in terms of how you'll fix it, but rather what is it that you're going to bring to the table, right? Be an ally. How is your nonprofit or the nonprofit that you work for going to show up for that community and amplify their voices, their thoughts, and their opinions? So I think it's less about the education piece. But I, you know, I shared my background. I had come from so many different avenues. And frankly, when you come from so many different places, you bring very many unique experiences that are necessary to fuel nonprofits, frankly. It needs business, it needs marketing, it needs finance, it needs all of those aspects of the work in addition to program people who are gonna be on the ground getting it done. So show up in terms of volunteering, even if they're on paid internships, you know, network, get the mentors, you know, within the space, whether that's sports or entertainment, um, get as close as you possibly can, because eventually, you know, yes, the relationships do matter. There aren't a ton of positions um, across, you know, uh, uh, sports teams, but there are a lot of opportunities in the, for, in the front office um, that are linked to the nonprofit of the right, teams. Sure. Um, and so think about it from that perspective. And then as we all know, there are so many non nonprofits. So it's, it's yeah. the world is your oyster. You know, one thing I tell almost every kid who comes to me with a vocational question outside of business, we at work in political campaigns, you know, work in advocacy. And I think this is true for nonprofit. I at least tell them you can either shoot me down or agree, but from your background, I think you might agree because often if they're they're more in the advocacy world. They hear this word and they kind of shrivel up and, oh God, I don't want to have to do that. But I say, take at least one basic accounting course so you can run a budget and you're not intimidated by management who uses accountant speak on you and you can operate in that world. And uh, I wonder what you think about that. I agree with you completely. It's a business right. and everyone right. has to remember it's a business, right? Sometimes they feel like startups. Sometimes they feel like small businesses. Sometimes they feel like you're, you feel like you're an entrepreneur, but at the end of the day, it's a business. And so all of those unique components are, are important and finance is abs and accounting is absolutely one of them. Cool. Oh, uh, I feel validated. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, right Bob, about, who, who has right not taken an accounting like. course, because I know where he stands on economic issues, but <laughs> go ahead. What do you got? No, no, you're, you're, you're right. You're half right about this. Uh, you should take accounting course, but where I stand on economic issues, I think is completely the right place. Anyway, to talk about economics, to talk about economics, Nicole, uh, the foundation did a lot of important work and has been doing a lot of important work, distributing food and PPE across Los Angeles. Uh, what happens after the pandemic? Yeah, you know what, fi families were financially struggling prior to the pandemic and Really, the pandemic exasperated what already existed in so many communities, Bob. COVID-19 shined a light on our weaknesses as a nation in terms of the incredible amount of people who are already living in poverty. And so the foundation and what happens after COVID is we continue. We continue to double down. We continue to support those communities. We've actually been on tours where we're continuing to provide food distributions and many other basic necessities. It's time for people to look at the root challenges and the root causes, um, often in Los Angeles, uh, for those who are living in poverty and force our nonprofits and force ourselves to make decisions about what we're going to implement additionally into what we were already doing to make sure that we're not putting a Band-Aid on top of things. And then when a cr another crisis hits, everything falls apart. I think that because we recognize the incredible need for essentials, we will certainly continue our type of support in addition to the core youth development work that we do, education and health and wellness. We're not going to forget what we learned under the spotlight of this awful pandemic. We recently um, completed a 10-stop tour, and we're actually about to stop, start another tour in the next couple of weeks. And it's about touching various neighborhoods throughout Los Angeles. We were able to issue an assessment to the, found to the families we serve and to the nonprofit organizations that we actually fund shortly after the pandemic hit. They told us what they want. They told us what we need. And our intention right now is to continue to show up for those things. 
We've actually donated and distributed over 4 million meals throughout this time and about 2.5 million in in-kind donations like food and education materials, technology and more. Um, it's about building upon that. We've learned a lot about being very intentional about addressing uh, basic necessities. The, 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 the problems and the biggest issues in Los Angeles, they're not going away because we've reopened. Those families are not all of a sudden cured. Things are not you know, better. And so providing uh, support during this recovery period is gonna be so important. Well, let, me do one guys... let me do Go one ahead. follow up on that. Uh, uh, you talked about being a first generation college graduate. I am too. Uh, what does the, and you alluded briefly to what the foundation does to sort of encourage kids to go to college and to further their education. Could you elaborate a little bit on that? Yes, so we actually have what we call the College and Career Accelerator. And so what we do is we work with college access and success nonprofits throughout Los Angeles. And so this is middle, middle school students right to and through college. And we not only just do things like fund scholarships or fund their programs, we host in partnership with local colleges and universities and these nonprofit sessions. During the pandemic, for example, we made sure that students knew what were the changes happening on UC campuses? What was the change happening at USC? What were the changes happening across the country in terms of how they would apply to college, how they would get to college? We serve a lot of undocumented um, families. And so we often have experts you know, who share in many of our sessions you know, what those families need to know. Financial aid in the FAFSA, it's tricky. It's complicated for low-income families. So we make sure we're educating on that. So it's a lot of education, Bob, in terms of making sure that through the Dodger brand and through our vehicles, whether that be here hosting it at the stadium or over the last 15 months virtually, we're showing up for students with information and bringing together experts to deliver that information um, to youth and their families. Okay, well, I think it's time to move on to our questions. If you have a question, please send it to us. You can use the chat function and then our, our team of hench people will arrange it and put it up here for me to read and probably mispronounce your name. So I apologize in advance, I'm barely literate. Okay, our first question is from Mr. Robbie Perkins Arango, who says, go Giants, best team in the league. Well, I get the feeling, Robbie, that you're actually Gabe Kapler here working under a funny name, but we're, we're let that one go by. And here's your question, which is excellent. Thank you for taking the time, Nicole, to speak with us. I wanted to ask how students such as us uh, can navigate the conversation with some members of the older generation <clears throat> who truly believe, let's see, what are, oh, who truly believe sports players are paid only to play. Furthermore, how can a constructive dialogue be created? So what do you think? How, how do we do that in a non- you know, polarized name calling manner to find a little unity. Yeah, I think that there's an opportunity for students to partner with players associations, right? And different individuals who might hold certain positions within the league to start some of these conversations. We all know that diversity, equity, and inclusion is such a, a hot topic. Um, it should be a consistent uh, recurring topic, but it's such a hot topic right now. And there are people who are working within sports franchises focused on making sure that issues are brought up, get, they're given a voice, they're discussed and things of that nature. So I feel like, you know, the opportunity to partner with the players associations, the par opportunity to partner with DEI professionals and diversity pipeline and executives across the sports teams to talk about how, you know, they might together serve as champions for the player's voice being more than what they're just simply being paid to do. Um, and even more, I think there's just an, there's a, there's some partnerships that need to be had. Students won't be able to do it alone. I think that's excellent. Okay, another question. This is from Diane Wallace. Does the Dodger Foundation publish the results of your work each year? We sure do, Diane. We um, have an impact report, as most nonprofits do. We post them on our website every single year. If you visit us at dodgers.com forward slash LADF, you can see the impact reports year over year. As I mentioned, we have a pretty robust uh, measurement and evaluation framework um, led by our manager of strategy and impact. And so our reports are literally outputs and outcomes, testimonials and more from our programs, from our initiatives, 
We share a full list um, of all of the nonprofit organizations that we have supported within that year. Uh, and then we also share our financials. Outstanding, transparency, nothing better. Yes. Brian Jensen, uh, oh, I had a great question from Brian. Beyond just politics, I've noticed how sports has, sports have become more involved in other aspects of society, like Naomi Osaka and mental health a few weeks back. Do you think athletes are speaking up more than previously? And why do you think that's happening right now? I honestly believe that many of them have served as an example and allowed others to feel uh, more freely to speak up. Uh, they've also come into themselves and understood, understand that they are human beings who may experience some of the same things that non-athletes experience, and that if they use their platform and their voice, they may be heard differently. It may be received differently, and frankly, they can be a great help to others. Um, I can't say that I don't believe that, you know, over the last year or so, particularly after the death of George Floyd, um, that more people are feeling like if there is something I care about, if there is something that I feel like I can change or influence the conversation on, I'm going to stand up and say and, and put that forward. Right. I applaud, you know, efforts of, you know, the WNBA, right, serving as such an amazing example of, as a team and their athletes uh, doing that. And I think that more organizations, teams, and, 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 and just front offices, whether that be ownership or leadership, are getting behind athletes and encouraging them, frankly, to use their voice. We see that corporations are doing it. You know, they're, they're encouraging people because it's probably some of the same things that they care about, whether that be in their philanthropy platforms or, or beyond. So a question here from Anonymous, it's so bad it's driven Bob out of the room. Uh, <laughs> Anonymous would like to know, and this is an interesting point, it's often forgotten that the Dodgers were brought to L.A. by displacing a number of Latino families in Chavez Ravine. How does that history inform the Dodgers, Dodger Foundation's advocacy and work? You know, 80 percent of the beneficiaries of the Los Angeles Dodgers Foundation are Latino families in and around Los Angeles. Um, we purposefully have an amazing connection with the community through our youth programs um, in, in so many different ways. The reality is I think the team also has an amazing connection to the Latino community as well. Um, there is an amazing uh, 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 lifelong sort of legacy of intergenerational families so connected to seats at Dodger Stadium, experiences at Dodger Stadium. One of the most exciting things about this year, you know, when we think about Fernando Venezuela and this being the 40th anniversary, celebrating those things and putting those, putting players, former players out there for the community is so important to us, right? Representation matters. Being able to, you know, show up for our Latino community here in Los Angeles by being able to share with them players who have so many various, you know, different backgrounds and stories um, it's unique, but it's so uh, normal for us as the Dodgers Foundation, just because we know the community that we serve. Julia Moreno would like to know, what advice would you give someone who wants to obtain a leadership director role in the nonprofit world? We kind of talked about this, but she has some uh, specific questions here. As a mid-level professional, I found it hard to move beyond that. How can you get people to believe in you and trust you to take on a leadership role? Yeah, um, I definitely feel like it's a combination, Mike, of some things you said in terms of there's some courses that you need to maybe just have under your belt that are just some of the basic framework things. But at the same time, I think that you've got to volunteer with organizations, especially if you're trying to make a switch to a nonprofit in order to be able to get to know individuals, in order to be able to tell your person, your, your story in person, um, and truly understand and have them understand what you're doing, right? I've known individuals who nonprofits have been their clients and they've ended up transitioning from the business side or corporate side to the nonprofit side. How can you get closest to a nonprofit? So if it's not volunteering, do you have a business relationship? Are you doing pro bono work? Um, are you showing up at their events? I think the networking piece is so important and ensuring that if you believe you can be a nonprofit leader, can you be a leader? So do you just have just the basics on the leadership side 
And then those two things end up coming together. There are some organizations, um, you know, when you think about locally here in Los Angeles, pay attention to Southern California grant makers and more in terms of understanding various nonprofits, you know, who they are and what they do, um, what are some of the roles that sit within, within those organizations. And frankly, some of those are listing uh, jobs all the time. So I would definitely pay attention to Southern California grant makers as well. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see my... Uh... Mike, let, let me let me yeah, interrupt. Go ahead. Let me interrupt with a question because when I was listening to you, it suddenly occurred to me: Are other major sports franchises uh, engaged in the same kind of work that your Dodgers Foundation is? I always say, of the thirty, you know, major league clubs, and of all of the leagues and teams, we all do this very differently. There's a handful of us that do it similarly, but it's customized to the city and the state in which you're, you're in. It's customized to who you're serving. Um, I will say with a lot of pride um, that the Dodgers Foundation, we do this in a very robust way. Um, our foundation is built uh, a little uniquely different um, um, than a lot of our other counterparts in the space. Uh, we have definitely made it its own like arm and its own animal in the best possible way because we believe that this is a piece of the broader pie in terms of overall Dodger success. Our relationship with the communities that we serve and having this standalone entity that is not responsible for putting butts in seats, but truly responsible for making sure that there's mission-driven work happening in the name of the Dodgers is very important. I don't think everyone is doing that. I do have, and I have felt in the last couple of years, there's been a movement towards establishing a foundation in this way, you know, one that's governed by a board of directors, one that makes decisions that are separate of the bottom line of the team. So a question from Sarah Simpson. What about conservatives in sports? Do you see the criticism some on the right lay on sports and media that conservatives in these circles don't feel they can discuss their political views. You know, there's a, they've got to join the progressive parade or be ostracized. What, what's your reaction to that question? That's a hard one. I feel like, you know, it's gonna be a while um, and some time before we're, we're moving in that direction. You're absolutely right. There are a lot of conservatives in the space. Um, you know, frankly, in baseball, we've been having the, the, the conversation very transparently, right? We are, we are so white. Baseball is so white. Um, baseball has been quite conservative. We have a lot of work to do, but I think it's about acknowledging that there is a lot of work to do and creating a plan and getting started. Um, Major League Baseball themselves recently hired a head of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, who's doing an amazing job, created a strategic framework, and teams are following suit. We're in local markets, even us as the Dodgers, um, you know, about three months ago, for the first time, we have a vice president of diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that there is a lot of movement when we think about, you know, uh, teams embracing pride nights and more. Um, we have a long way to go, but I do um, totally agree uh, with the individual that answered the question. Um, it's an obstacle, it's a challenge, but I do think that we're moving in the right direction by educating ourselves. Uh, Michaela Hughes wants to know, is there an intersection between nonprofits and social justice organizations? For example, what role did or should the LA Dodgers Foundation play in social movements like BLM? So social justice organizations, we actually fund a number of social justice organizations. And the reality is those that are for us falling into our focus areas of moving youth forward as a means to ensuring um, that social injustices, frankly, are, are ripped away from their lives, right? And so I definitively feel like there's a relationship between social justice organizations and nonprofits, very much like the way in which we are going to um, evaluate any other nonprofit. That is the same criteria that we use when we think about how we're gonna partner with a social justice organization. But social justice organizations are not going to be progressive if they don't have allies in nonprofit organizations. They need funding um, for you to be able to organize. They need funding to be able to advocate. Um, and similarly, I think other nonprofits are just looking at it as, hey, do they fall within 
the guidelines that I have set for myself as a foundation. And frankly, I think in the last year, many foundations have opened up themselves to say, wow, I hadn't considered social justice organizations, but if I really want to be a part of change and a part of moving things forward and I want to be an ally, I am probably going to have to think about how do they fit into my portfolio of grantees. Uh, Anonymous 2 wants to know I, with this question, I know that there's a distinction between the Dodgers Foundation and the team itself, but how much do you collaborate with the players? Um, the answer to that is a lot. Um, the players have yet another vehicle uh, through the Dodgers Foundation to be able to um, execute on a lot of what they care about. We partner with player foundations um, to fund things collaboratively. We partner with player foundations to host fundraisers. Um, we do a lot with player foundations. We have a number of players that contribute to the Dodgers Foundation financially every year, but they also show up for us when we ask them to record videos, when we ask them to come out to events, when we ask them to engage with youth and families, when we ask them to meet uh, and greet youth and families at the stadium. Um, so very significantly, we get a chance to you know, meet our new players every single year at spring training and the relationship starts there. Players um, autograph significant amounts of memorabilia that we auction off to fundraise for the foundation annually. And so I will tell you very, very much so. I like to ask the players very early in the season about you know, what they, what they care about, what they're looking for and how the foundation can work with them. We've helped some players launch their own foundations. And so very, very closely is the answer to that question. Brock Dewey is asking, well, first of all, a little editorial, congrats on the World Series championship. I'm <laughs> sure that the foundation had to adapt through the pandemic. How has it affected? Where were the impacts and what will be the plans going forward as things hopefully get back to normal? Yeah, you know what? So interestingly enough, people, I'm glad, glad for that question. We were impacted um, from a fundraising perspective when you think about the dollars that we raised to win stadium fund. I think Nicole's frozen. Yeah, I wasn't sure if I was or she was. So we're give the. Uh... The inter this wouldn't happen to a Tigers fan. We secretly control the internet. Uh, but hopefully she'll be right back. Uh, well, let's see. I think she'll be right back in. So, Bob, do you have the score? I don't think they're playing yet, but the Tigers are up against the Los Angeles Angels today. Yep, nope, game. I don't think it started yet. So we can't do the score report. When we, when we wait for Nicole to come back. What's your second favorite team? Uh, the Red Sox. Oh my God! You're, you're oh, 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 oh. Uh, what, what can I? What can it's I? Where say? I grew up and where I went to school, you know. Yeah, that, no, no, that that makes some sense. I I totally get it. Um, and Nicole is back. There she is. We lost oh. power at Dodger Stadium. Crazy. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Tell McCord to pay the bill. Uh, okay. But we're back. We're back. All right. All right. Well, so you were answering the question about the how you would just post pandemic as we head to normalcy. Yes. And I was sharing that, you know, I was so happy that we received that question. A lot of foundations um, throughout the pandemic, um, you know, lost of significant sources, lost significant sources of, re of revenue. Without fans and stands, we were not able to meet our fundraising objectives, but we were certain that we were going to partner with so many individuals on the ground to continue to deliver the services and the things that we would have to our families. We have to do it differently. So instead of in person, we actually adjusted to drive through distributions where you know, we safely were serving our families via their cars. Um, we pivoted to fundraising, uh, uh, the very, very innovative fundraising techniques like the fan cutouts in stadium. And so yes, there were no fans and there was no 50-50 raffle and other ways that we raised dollars, but we raised you know, $2 million from fan cutouts. People wanted to be here and they were okay if it was their cardboard cutout uh, in a seat at a game. And so we got very creative um, and innovative. And the reality is I think we learned a lot about a few things that we will continue to do moving forward, right? It forced you to think differently than your, your typical annual, we're gonna do this event and raise this money. We're gonna do this event and serve these families. Um, I tell people all the time, while we're all over Zoom and over all of this, the reality is there are some people who came to the table who otherwise couldn't, whether it be for 
scheduling issues or transportation issues, this virtual setting has allowed us to reach a significantly more amount of families, youth, and more across Los Angeles. So looking forward to actually finding a hybrid method of delivering programming, a hybrid method of fundraising. And I have to say, I'm just, I'm glad that we're back, you know, to have 52,000 fans at Dodger Stadium the last two nights uh, has been pretty amazing and it will help us serve more and more youth in years to come. So quick detail note before you send Bob angry letters. I know McCord sold the team, but I complained <laughs> about him for so long. I just like doing it now. Old habits die hard. All right, from Herberto Arabula. Thank you, Nicole, and the Dodger Foundation for their leadership and impact with the community. I grew up through some of the foundation's programs. My question is, what do you foresee the foundation accomplishment, excuse me, accomplishing going forward in the next five or 10 years? So as you continue to grow and succeed, what does the next big win look like? Yeah, you know what, we have had, um, first of all, Roberto, I'm so glad you were part of our, our programs and just glad that you're on here. Um, we have had so many things, amazing things happen in the last couple of years that for us, it really is about continuing to double down in communities and expand our impact. Um, there is still so much demand for our youth development program. There's so much demand for Dodgers Dream Fields. We recently hit 50 fields and we're actually going to do 75 fields by the 75th anniversary of the Dodgers move to Los Angeles, which is 2033. We know that we want to be able, we serve currently 10,000 youth in our Dodgers RBI program. We intend to serve 25,000 youth by 2030. And so it is about expansion, Roberto, into different neighborhoods, into additional neighborhoods that need us most. Um, Los Angeles and greater Los Angeles is a very big place. And so we have some additional places we want to go. The Inland Empire, uh, we've created and begun to, to, to talk about a lot of relationships and things that are happening out there. There are communities that need us outside of inner city Los Angeles. And a huge part of what we will do is expansion, um, as well as continuing to support uh, via grants and an increased grant program, um, the, the nonprofit organizations locally that really do need us. Um, thinking about their, their, their struggles over the last year, um, we wanna be able to show up more and be partners with grantees on the ground. Okay, one more question from Anonymous, number three. We have a lot of Anonymous. <laughs> anonymous is demanding to know, you mentioned that you're proudest of the fact that you're considered a trusted ally um, in the places the foundation operates. Was it hard to win over the trust of those communities at first, especially after you know the history of the foundation before you revitalized it? Yeah, I definitely think it was hard. I think it was a significant challenge. It takes time and it takes creating community-driven programs. We hosted a zillion focus groups. We involved so many stakeholders, so many communities into the creation of what people see right now as the Dodgers Foundation. That was the key. Um, that takes time. So did it take a couple of years? Absolutely. But I am proud that what we do is community driven. What we do is in response to the needs of those that we serve and we continue to assess the situation so that they are helping us improve upon what we do on a regular basis. Excellent, excellent. Well, look, I wanna thank you, Nicole. I know Bob does too. We're so grateful to have you as a fellow and for the good work you do for our city. Now, speaking of anonymous, the king, the absolute king of the anonymi, Mr. Miles Taylor, former official in the Trump administration who wrote the book. Uh, I, I don't remember the title of the book, but it was known as um, the anonymous book. He will be here for the next bully pulpit. Speaking about the ever, ever raging topic of the GOP civil war, he's a former Homeland Security official and Miles is also an incoming CPF fellow. So mark your calendar and you can sign. I think a lot of people ought to ask anonymous questions to anonymous. I think we ought to set a Guinness record with this one. It's gonna be July 15th at 12 p.m. Pacific time. Check out the Center for the Political Futures website for more information, and we hope you join us for that one. Uh, uh, Bob, why don't you close no, us out? Yeah, Nicole, thank you very much. We're very enthused about the fact that you're joining us. Uh, I think students are gonna be very excited about your class. Uh, 
And I learned a lot today listening to you. So I want to thank you. And I want to thank our audience. And I want to extend once again, final, final sympathies to Mike uh, <laughs> on, on, the, on the Detroit Tigers. I our mean, you're day will come. Them. Our day <laughs> will come, Bob. All right. Thank you all. Thank Hope you, Mike. The thank next you, one. Bob. Looking forward thank to it. All right. Take Bye-bye, care. Nicole.